By 1800, Halifax merchants wanted to open a passage into Nova Scotia's rich inland resources, and eager army officers needed a faster way to get their troops to the Bay of Fundy. Though primitive trails and roadways did exist, they were often sporadic and inaccessible. Engineers employed to investigate a reliable passage from Dartmouth Cove to Cobblequid Bay concluded that the best path to follow was the route that had been used by the Mi'kmaq for centuries. After all, two-thirds of it was already a navigable river. Construction began on several large stone locks in 1826, financed through the sale of stocks and government bonds. But by 1831, the entrepreneurs had run out of money and construction stalled. Twenty-three years later, a new design was introduced, based on the Morris Canal in New Jersey, using a water-powered marine railway running up an inclined plane, replacing the first five locks. It would lift the boats and equipment up the slope from Halifax Harbour to Sullivan's Pond. The Shubenacadie Canal opened for business in 1861. At high tide, a brakeman let the cradle car slide slowly down the rails, through the hand-dug cuts in the dark slate, and then under the town's main street to meet the arrival of the loaded barges. Muscles, ropes, and experience ensured that the barge slipped neatly into the cradle and the load secured. Hand signals were then passed up the line to the flume house. Halfway up the slope on the second floor of the structure, an operator would disengage the clutch so that one of the six-foot steel bevel gears was ready to turn. There were two of those great gears, one for going up the plane and the other for the eventual descent. Next came the hand crank which raised the plug holding back the water in the flume from Sullivan's Pond. The pond was actually a man-made reservoir dug to retain enough water to operate the five locks of the first canal phase. When the plug was lifted, the water, about three feet deep, rushed forward along the wooden flume and dropped into the 45-foot-long penstock with enough force to rotate the specially designed scotch turbine deep in the stone vault below. As the water filled the turbine, it rotated those bevel gears, plus a crown gear, and turned a huge winding drum which spooled the wire rope connected to the cradle car. At the same time, the water which coursed through the turbine flowed out of the flume house along the tail race to the harbor. That wire cable was 3,600 feet long. Running through sheaves and around pulleys in both directions, it circled the entire length of the inclined plane. The 12-foot steel drum in the flume house let the cable unwind from one side and it took up the slack on the other. The system was quite elaborate for its time and local residents always stopped to take notice of the operation. The clanking of the gears, the tons of goods, and the trouble-free elegance of using water power to lift 80 to 100 tons up a height of 56 feet, they were a real attraction in the hard-working town of Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Unloading the barge at Sullivan's Pond was as straightforward as the loading process had been at the harbour below. Once the car had passed up and over the circular dam, which held back the water in Sullivan's Pond, it dropped into the holding pond, where the barge and its cargo floated freely away. Music 
After about 15 minutes, the brakeman stopped his boat cradle, signaled the operator in the flume house who cranked the plug back into its place in the penstock, and without the water flow, the turbine ceased to rotate in the stone chamber and the winding drum went silent. One last job remained for the operator as he activated the clutch and disengaged the gears from the drum. At this point, there was a decision to make. Should the cradle car remain at the top of the plane waiting for a possible return passage with another barge, or should the operator re-engage the gears and the cable and take the structure back down to the harbor for another load? On a few occasions, there was good demand for moving cargo from the harbor and into the canal. At other times, the system sat idle. Up at the head pond, the Avery, or another of three coal-fired towboats, attached a line to the barge, and the pair headed off, through the marker pylons and into the first lock of the Shubenacadie Canal. Although troops rarely traveled on the canal, Raw materials regularly steamed through all nine of the locks, each of the seven lakes, and both of the inclined plains for most of the ten years the canal was open. But the waterway had been expensive to build. Construction had taken too long. Hostile lawsuits and heated debates in the Nova Scotia legislature all tainted the canal story. Finally, it could not compete with the coming of the railroad. Some of the last few barges which plied the canal carried the rails and timbers used to construct the railroad bridges over the waterway. Those structures were too low to allow canal barges to pass underneath, finally sealing her fate. The Avery and the other vessels had served Nova Scotia well for that time, but when the canal ceased operation in 1871, they disappeared. Few people noticed. That unique turbine was also lost to history after an insolvency sale and the chamber was repurposed for a foundry where the world-famous star ice skates were made using the same water power. The story of the canal would be lost too were it not for the dedicated volunteers of today's Shubenacadie Canal Commission. Their efforts over the past 30 years have unearthed the stoneworks, opened up the waterway, and recreated some of the structures as they might have appeared during the canal's operation. She's now yours to explore.